Um, so we talked about this yesterday when we did our reading and our homework, and we talked about exactly what Imperial Japan was. So t in today's lesson, we are going to look at how did Japan become an imperial power, what is an imperial power, and then we're going to identify a guy named Hideki Tojo. So we're going to build a little bit on what we talked about yesterday. So prior to the Europeans arriving in Japan in the 1500s, we know that Japan was a feudal society. And we talked a lot about what a feudal society is, about how there's no real central government, but there's a Japanese emperor who was a religious power, okay? And we talked about the daimyo, the Japanese peasants, and the samurai. We also discussed Bushido, okay? When did the first Europeans arrive in Japan? Well, the first Europeans were the Portuguese, and they arrived in Japan by accident, okay? And so here you see a super cool picture of what the Japanese envisioned or saw the Portuguese kind of looking like. You can see they didn't have a whole lot of respect for them from this picture. Um, they brought European technology with them, ex especially firearms. At first they were welcome, but eventually they were forced out by the shoguns. And the shoguns basically said, we don't need Europeans, we're going to be on our own for the next 200 years. So, we, after those two, 200 years of isolation, how did it come to an end? We talked about this yesterday. U.S. Naval Officer Commodore Matthew Perry arrived in Japan. You might know Matthew Perry from a TV show named Friends. This guy's got the same last name, in, or the same name in general, in case you didn't know. All right, so he forced the Shoguns to accept a trade treaty with the U.S. He did it through intimidation. Okay, so basically he said... You either allow the United States to trade freely as they want with you, and you open up your doors to us, or we bomb you and we hit you with cannons. So the Japanese said, okay. And they called Commodore Perry's ships black ships because it was seen as kind of a curse. So why Japan? What did the U.S. want from Japan? The U.S. wanted a couple things for, or the U.S. wanted a couple things from um, Japan. They wanted more trading partners in raw materials, and they wanted a haven, meaning a safe place to go for shipwrecked sailors. In 1853, U.S. Commodore Matthew Perry opens up, and it's it's in quotation marks there because. It was so such a forced thing that it wasn't really opened up. He forced it to happen, okay? Um, so that is what the Treaty of Kanagawa is. The Treaty of Kanagawa is where the treaty was signed to officially open up trade from Japan. It ended Japan's 200 years of isolation. The shoguns were deeply criticized for signing this treaty at first. Keep in mind, we talked about this yesterday, the rest of the world was industrializing or changing from a handmade society to an entire um, kind of machine-oriented society where everything is made by machines. Japan was behind on the times. The shoguns realized this and they felt not only intimidation from the United States that they would be hurt if they didn't do this, but that they would be left behind. So here are the shoguns bowing to Commodore Matthew Perry and five years later in comes President Buchanan showing awesome that it was awesome that Japan did that. What was the 
Meiji Revolt then. Yesterday it was called the Meiji Revolution. Um, you can call it a couple different things. The Meiji Revolt in this case, like we talked about yesterday, was the idea that they were going to now do away with the old way of government. They were no longer have going to have the shoguns in power and the emperor was going to get more influence. People were angry with the shogun for quote unquote opening up Japan. They wanted to see the emperor return to power. Remember, in feudalism, the emperor was just the spiritual leader. Okay? Now they wanted him to have real political power. They believed that this would return Japan to that traditional way of life. Okay? However, the guy that came into power as uh, emperor is Emperor Mutsuhito. And Emperor Mutsuhito was only 15 years old when he took power. And he had a big interest in Western technology. Like a lot of young kids, he was interested in cutting edge things. And he saw the West. Now when we say the West, we mean Europe and we mean the United States. He saw them as being really cool. He wanted to have their technology. But he didn't just want Japan to have their technology. He wanted to modernize them all around. So look at this picture and you see that this guy is what, they're in the 1870s, is what they're calling enlightened. This guy's half enlightened and this guy's unenlightened. So he looks like your traditional feudal Japanese samurai. This guy's kind of halfway in between. But this guy looks like a United States Western um, white kind of American and he's totally enlightened. So the idea was Japanese spirit, Western technology. The Japanese became obsessed with Western styles. They grew, they dressed just like the United States and like Europe. Even their soldiers began to dress not like samurai, but like Western soldiers. So even the emperor began to lead the way with his dress style. The samurai don't like it, obviously, and we've talked a lot about this. Um, there was the Battle of Boshin where the samurai, we studied this a lot, and the guy leading the way, of course, was Tom Cruise. No, that's actually not true. Um, but we talked a lot about The Last Samurai and how the samurai got pushed out by this change. The Meiji Revolt pushed out the samurai. So how did the Meiji reform Japanese society? How did it change it? And you write down two ways that I'm going to show you here. Okay. All these things. The abolition or getting rid of feudal society redistributing land amongst the people, westernizing schools, modernizing armies, building a navy, um, worshiping the emperor again, human rights and religious freedom, written constitution, and a modern banking system. So you need to write down two of these things. And then how did it change the government? Well, the government was now inspired by European constitutions. So they never had a constitution before. Everything was ruled by these shoguns. They never write, wrote anything down. They just passed the rules down to the peasants, and the peasants did whatever, they, whatever the samurai demanded of them. Okay, so now they have a constitution and rulers. They're a lot more civilized. They have... Um, in a Japanese government, all power is vested, meaning given to the emperor. But now they have the people having a say as well in the government with the Japanese diet or the idea of Congress with two houses, the House of Representative and the House of Peers. When you look at the Japanese diet, it looks a lot like the House of Congress does here in the United States. 
So they were copying everything from that, including imperialism. You define this in your homework as a policy of extending a country's power through diplomacy or military force. So now that Japan was industrialized, now that they were westernized and they looked like the United States and like Europe, they wanted to be a world power. And in order to be a world power, they had to get more land than just their islands. They wanted to try to almost, as you see in this picture, carve up the world and over here. So, Japan wanted to be an imperialistic power for three reasons. To gain raw materials, which they didn't have much of, okay? To conquer people and their racial attitudes about um, the Japanese, negative things that people thought about the Japanese. And they wanted to show the world that they were now a military power. And they wanted to be a leader and the spokesperson for Asia. So check out this picture over here. It looks just like um, the Star Wars picture, uh, The Empire Strikes Back. So that's kind of similar to an imperialistic power. And you got the Death Star back there instead of the sun. I think that's a cool picture. All right, the Sino-Japanese War. We talked about this yesterday. China and Japan fighting over control of Korea China sues for peace after six months of fighting. Japan takes over Korea completely. Okay. The next war, 1904, they pick a fight over portions of Russia and China called Manchuria with Russia. Everyone assumed Russia would win because Russia was the old school major power. Here they are raising their feet just like they're kicking butt. And they were wrong. Russia loses big. Okay. So now Japan is really in the mix. Okay. Take a look at this picture. Here's Teddy Roosevelt. This guy's got the Japanese flag on, the, on his back. Here's Russia. And he says, let them have peace. In fact, Teddy Roosevelt was given the Nobel Peace Prize for that. Way to go, Teddy. Rough riders forever. Japan joins the Allies for World War I. So Japan joins the side of Italy in World War I in order to try to take over more land for themselves. Well, they lose the war, but... It really shows that Japan now has power, prestige, and land and is the dominant force in Asia. Um, and the UN allows this to happen. They don't really see them as a threat, but the Asians do. Okay. So if you look at this, you see that all this land right here Parts of Russia right here that they got in the Russo-Japanese War, um, the Sino-Japanese -Jap War right here, and then this part of Manchuria, then extending all the way out here where the blue areas, I know it's hard to see, are United States regions. So you can kind of understand why they bombed Hawaii because they wanted to keep expanding this way. So, who is Hideki Tojo? This is one of our essential questions. Hideki Tojo was a military officer turned politician, and he became Japan's prime minister during the Meiji era. He was heavily influenced by Japan, Japanese military tradition like Bushido. Um, we talked about Bushido quite a bit. Hideki Tojo is the one who goes to Berlin in 1936 and agrees to meet up with Japan, Germany, and Italy, and they become the Allied Powers, and they look to take over all of Asia in 1939 when Germany invades Poland, and they love each other because they want to take over all of Asia. So they say that they are the three... And we're the three best friends that anybody could have. We're the three best friends that anyone could have. We're the three best friends that anybody could have. We're the three best friends that anyone could have. We're the three best friends that anyone could have. We're the three best friends that anyone could have. We're the three best friends that anyone could have. We're the three best friends
the three best friends that anyone can have, and we'll never, ever, 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 ever leave each other. We're the best three friends that anybody can have. So the reason I showed you that is because Japan, Italy, and Germany were the best three friends they could ever have because they loved gaining more land. You see here, Japan is huge now. They have taken over almost all of Southeast Asia. China is smaller. Parts of um, Beijing and Hong Kong are, are now under Japanese control. So it's getting crazy. So Japan decides that it's going to drag the U.S. into the war because they wanted to take over the Hawaiian Islands too. Okay, And after they drag the U.S. into the war, the U.S., as we said, comes back, fights the war against the Allied, po the Allied powers and the Axis powers, which they were a part of, um, dominates Japan and ends the war, okay, this is another picture of Pearl Harbor, which is when they, when the Japanese uh, bombed Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. So the U.S. ends Imperial Japan, and how do they end it? Here's a little bit to show you here. Not a whole lot of sound, but this is the picture of Nagasaki and Hiroshima being bombed by the United States. Um, this is Little Boy, which is the one in Nagasaki. And then they have, I believe it's called Fat Boy, is Hiroshima. So we'll talk more about the atomic bomb, Fat Man, Fat Man.